We have uh, five, four members present and two on the phone, Dr. Sivak and Ms. Barbara Hilliard. Therefore, we have a quorum. We have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? I so move. Second. Ms. Thompson has moved. Ms. Johnson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Aye. There being none, the motion is approved. We have all also had the opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the April 18th, 2023 regular board meeting minutes? I so move. Second. Ms. Thompson has moved. Ms. Johnson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none, the motion is approved. And now we're to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Luckett. Good evening, board members. Good evening to the entire Jackson Public Schools community, all those who are uh, with us here in the board room and those who may be listening um, to the live recording. We'll begin, as we typically do, with some updates from our um, instructional television team. Two seniors at JPS Tougaloo Early College High School have been awarded millions of dollars in academic scholarships. Tynia Buckley received $3.7 million and Sydney Thompson received $2.1 million. Both students credit their strong support system and educators for guidance. Buckley plans to pursue a career in computer engineering, while Thompson has aspirations of becoming a business entrepreneur in the hotel and resort industry. Murrah High School's Lady Mustangs basketball team will now be led by a familiar face. I'm literally living in answer prayer. It's always been a desire and a dream of mine to reach back and give back to the community that molded me. So I'm very, very pleased and excited to be uh, welcomed back um, as a Lady Mustang and a Mustang for life. I'm, I've always said forever 1400, that's been the hashtag. Candace Foster, a Murrah alumna who played college basketball at Mississippi State, was named the new basketball coach of the Lady Mustangs. Come back with a better record and her to teach us life lessons mm -hmm. and to just make us a better person and a, and a basketball player. Foster was a Lady Mustang when they won three championships and is excited to bring her experience and leadership to the team. This Saturday, May 6th, you have an opportunity to help JPS scholars. The Michael D. Johnson Memorial Foundation will host its annual 5K Walk and Run in downtown Jackson at 8 a.m. Donations and money raised from this event will fund scholarships for JPS scholars. To register, donate, or learn more, visit Michael D. Johnson Foundation Org. Attention parents and guardians, it's that time of year again. The JPS 2023-24 school year registration is now open. You can register your child on site at enrollment services or through their school. But the quickest and easiest way is to enroll online through the JPS website at jackson.k12.ms.us or through the JPS mobile app. Registration times are as follows, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Enrollment Services, Poindexter Administrative Complex, 1017 Robinson Street, and 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. at school sites. Registration is open to new and returning students, including pre-K and kindergarten scholars. No appointments are required. If you register before May 24th, you'll be entered into a raffle for gift cards. Don't miss out on this chance to ensure your child is ready for day one of the next school year by starting pre-enrollment now. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash jpsitv. I want to thank our team for uh, those, those updates and for... Um, helping us to capture all these wonderful um, uh, news items from around Jackson Public Schools, the entire district. Um, board members and, and to our community members, I want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that um, this is a week of celebrations. Uh, yesterday, May 1st, um, nationally we recognize as uh, School Principals Day, so we certainly want to lift up our school principals. Um, again, we celebrate that each May 1st of, of, of the year. Today, 
Uh, the May, May 2nd happens to be the Teacher Appreciation Day, and that's celebrated the first Tuesday uh, in May of each year. So I want to give our teachers, all of our teachers, a round of applause and show them some love. And, and while teachers, I'm sure, all over the place have been recognized today, next week will be Teacher Appreciation Week, so they get a day and a week, just the way it, it falls. Um, it's the first Tuesday in May is Teacher Appreciation Day, um, but we also celebrate the first full week of May. It just happens not to be this week because May started on a Monday and not a Sunday, so technically next week is the first full week of May. So again, they get today and then we come back around for a full week of celebrating our teachers. I don't know that we could ever celebrate our teachers enough, so it's not a bad deal. So um, just know that we'll continue to, to shout them out and highlight some of the wonderful work that they are doing um, all day, every day in our schools. Uh, board members, as you all know, one of, our, one of my pet projects um, is the Global Citizenship Project. Uh, it's an opportunity for JPS high school scholars to learn with and from their peers from across the country um, and even in other countries uh, while expanding their understanding of social, cultural, historical connections between Jackson, Baltimore, Maryland, and Lagos, Nigeria. Um, there's so many benefits to um, our scholars learning about and experiencing, actually experiencing in that space, these various cultures. Um, and even learning more about what it means to be a Jacksonian and the history and the culture and um, you know, all that, that makes us Jackson. Well, I'm excited this year, uh, this being our second year of running this project, I'm excited to say that I will join our scholars when they travel this Friday to Lagos, Nigeria. So um, if you need me, I'll be in Lagos. <laughs> send me a note. Um, at this time, I'm excited to ask uh, Jana Williams, who serves as our district's college and career readiness manager, to join us and say a few words more about this special project and to introduce a few of our scholars who will be um, joining, us, joining us on this trek and give them a, a minute to say a few words. Ms. Williams. Let's give Ms. Williams a round of applause, please. She's been amazing at shepherding this project from uh, an idea to a reality two years running. And so, hey, we've got a number of our scholars here. I didn't know so many were going to be able to make it. Good and this, in fact, is all of the scholars, correct? We're missing one. We're missing my, one. My birthday. Okay. Well, happy <laughs> birthday to her. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Green and board members. Thank you all for having us um, today. I just wanted to introduce our students that are our GCP students for this school year. And y'all can just wave your hand. We have Ariana, Ariel Brumfield, both from Tougaloo Early College um, with Murrah, Madison Cormack from Murrah High School. Jalen Fell from Forest Hill High School, Alana Harp from Murrah High School, Deja Granderson, um, Tulu Early College, Callaway, Faith Mellon Becca, Tulu College, Murrah, and Christopher Gala, Murrah High School. And Faith is our student representative that will talk about what we've done so far in the program. Greetings, I am Faith Malambeka, a ninth grader at the JPS Tougaloo College, Early College High School, and an ambassador for the second cohort of the Jackson Public School District's Global Citizenship Project. And the Global Citizenship Project, as you all heard, allows scholars to learn from and with our peers around the world. And more specifically, we were learning the connections between Jackson, Baltimore, and Nigeria on a level of culture, society, and history. While in Baltimore, my peers and I peer, paired with the Global Citizenship Project group from Baltimore to learn their environment um, at the City Neighbors High School, in which they're a project-based learning high school. And so they do and complete projects instead of state tests to conclude their school year. Mm. And, um, but much like the JPS 
students, we have intelligent and brilliant and creative scholars. And my peers and I also ate foods in the city, listening to the stories and the meanings behind the foods, much like those of the South. And we were also learn of the history of the sit-ins, which in protest for equal rights, both in Baltimore and connecting to Mississippi as well. And in DC, we were able to conclude our trip with the visit to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And the Global Citizenship Project has given my peers and I an opportunity to network with others, making similar connections between our spaces and our world, in which our histories and cultures are all similar. I look forward to doing more with the Global Citizenship Project and in the future. Thank you. Now, Faye did a great job. You see how awesome these students are? Mm -hmm. So we are headed to Lagos on Friday. We will be there for a week where we'll discover, meet with our friends at Prudence City College. And then we'll do a tech tour. We'll have a beach day. Um, we'll um, go to the Nike Museum to learn about the art and history. And we'll also visit Abuja. So we have a um, great week ahead of us, a lot of activities. And I'm excited to share this with the students. And thank you, Dr. Green, for letting this be one of your projects and including uh, myself and all of the students. Thank you. I'm, again, I'm just so excited about this project. It's one I've mentioned before, but just to clarify for everyone, this is a project that is funded. Uh, it was seeded by the Hewlett Foundation and continued and, and partially funded this year um, with some funding from the Kellogg Foundation. Um, Hewlett Foundation, just a note there, um, they have become a, a, a strong uh, partner to us. They've, they've uh, given us two rounds of funding and, and continue to engage with us. Uh, uh, representatives from their foundation were here la last week, last week, um, and met with several uh, folks from around Jackson Public Schools just to better understand what we're up to, what some of the challenges that we're working through, and um, listening intently, intently um, for ways that they can continue to support us. So, um, Student voice is one uh, piece of their major focus and constantly looking for ways to lift up and hear from and learn from our scholars. And so um, this project kind of came out of that focus of theirs and this desire of ours to lift up scholars' voices to help them to, to learn from one another and, and to even teach us. So uh, again, I can't say enough about it, can't say enough about uh, this opportunity and um, our hopes to continue to build this out so that many, many more of our scholars can participate over time. So um, do keep us in your prayers and our travels, and uh, we look forward to coming back and sharing more about the project um, following this trek to Lagos. All right. Uh, next, board members, I, I hope you had even a, a moment, a second to look at some of the artwork that's displayed here in the boardroom. This work is, um, was done by some of our fantastic JPS scholars, and I'm excited to celebrate their achievements tonight. At this time, Wells APAC visual art teacher, Rena Moore Edwards, will join us to tell us a little bit more about the um, 2023 Scholastic Art and Writing Awards in the Mississippi Regional Competition and to introduce some of our fantastic scholars. Some more evidence. Hello, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> making sure the mic works. Um, hi, uh, I wanna introduce a few of our scholars that have received awards in the art division of the National Scholastics Art and Writing Awards. Um, presented by the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, this competition is the country's longest running and most prestigious scholarship and recognition program for creative students in grades 7 through 12. This year, which marks the 100th year of the awards, more than 100,000 teens from across the United States entered more than 300,000 works of art and writing. Wow. We're less than 12% receive regional awards, such as gold and silver keys, and less than 1% receive national awards, such as gold and silver medals. This year at the Mississippi Art Regional level, Wells APAC scholars received a total of 130 awards, mm -hmm. which put them, <laughs> which put them, <laughs> <laughs> 
which put them at receiving the most gold and silver keys in the state. Mm -hmm. This is the fourth year in a row that the APEC yes. scholars have received the oh. most gold and silvers of the state. Um, at the national level, Wells Scholars received seven awards, four gold, two silver medals, and the American Vision Medal. And we have a small selection of the pieces on display here tonight and, um, and a few of the students that won those awards. Uh, first, we have seventh grader Edward Hall. He received a gold medal for his painting, Throwing Shade. Hmm. <laughs> Next, 10th grader Tracy Robinson received a gold medal for her mixed media plate, Braided Curves. Ninth grader Jalea Bell received a gold medal for her painting, Way in the Back of the Fridge. <laughs> and I will say this is actually Jalea's second national medal. Um, and then um, senior Dion Hines received a silver medal for his piece, The Binder, a gold medal, and the American Vision Medal for his mixed media piece, Layer by Layer. <laughs> Um, the American Vision Medal is considered like the best in show, and I will say Dion, over his um, four years in high school, has won four gold national medals, four silver national medals, best in 10th grade, and the National Civic Expression Award. So, very high quality award. Thank you. So I just want to say another word. We'll, we'll, we'll take a picture in a second. Just want to say another word here. You heard that for several years running, we've taken home some national um, and top awards for our arts programming. And I can't help. Every year I'm like, okay, which one do I want to buy? Which one do I want to buy? Because, you know, they're so amazing. Please, please, please. Like, it's wonderful that we celebrate here at this board meeting, and I'm, I'm open to other ways that we can celebrate and share this wonderful work of our scholars, but I, I still get the sense that most people don't, do not know, most people here in Jackson, I mean, do not know how amazing this work is every year, year after year, and I just enlist y'all's help with getting the word out there about just how amazing this is. Let's give our scholars another round of applause and our amazing instructor. I was just uh, reminded that our art show is up for another week and a half at Collage Gallery at High. It's off of High Street. Off of High Street. Can we uh, make sure that we get this on social media? The the um, location and the final date or the the date that it runs. Just want to. Okay. I want to make sure that folks know um, where to go and see this amazing work. Congratulations, young folks. Uh -huh. Congratulations. Jeez. Such talented young people. Uh, lastly, board members, um, as you know, uh, we've been hosting some parent and community meetings to discuss some of the, um, to discuss the temporary relocation plans and, and the two additional proposals that uh, were presented uh, April 18th at that board meeting. Tonight I'll provide an update on some of those uh, relocation plans. Um, and bring back around uh, those two proposals related to Baker and Brinkley and Lanier High School um, for your uh, action. And at that time, I'll give a little more uh, context and a little more information as to what we learned, what we heard from parents, and uh, some of the adjustments we're making in, in our relocation plans. Uh, board members, at this time, uh, that concludes my remarks. 
And um, I turn the meeting back over to you, Dr. Luckett. Thank you, Dr. Green. Our students are amazing. It really is inspiring to see, and it's always great to have them here. Uh, with all the news there is out there, to be able to celebrate those young people, uh, yeah. they shall lead us, that's for sure. Absolutely. Do we have any participants for public comments? Yes. Community members who would like to make public comments should email their request to roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. the day of a meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 p.m. the day of the meeting. Before we get started with public participation, I'd like to set some general expectations. You will have three minutes for your comments. Attorney Turner keeps the minutes. However, during our teleconference meeting, our moderator may keep time for you if that's necessary, but obviously we're here. The board believes the public's comments are very important. We'll listen and consider your comments, but we will not respond at this time. If there is an issue that you have not taken to leadership at a particular school or to district administration, we encourage you to do so. And board members can be reached at our email addresses, which are on the JPS website. Uh, Attorney Turner. Board members, the first person to address you this evening, Mr. Bobby Brown, who wants to address you regarding support of the proposed consolidation and school repairs. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, Bobby D. Brown is my name, principal of Jim Hill High School. And so what I want to share with you all today that I've been in the Jim Hill High School community for the past 18 years of my professional career. Nine of those have been principal at Jim Hill High School. And during that time, we have been challenged with our HVAC. Of course, things beyond our control, you see the high water uh, during times of rain. But more importantly, that the inconveniences that we've experienced across the years, um, it does create inconsistent patterns of attending school for our scholars. Um, it challenges us as instructors um, because as a moment's notice, we may have to shift um, classrooms from one building to another building um, for, to have ha for air or heat, uh, depending upon where we are at that particular time. Uh, we will have mild inconveniences for a year. But well, we're talking about mild inconveniences for a year for a project that can be substantial aided for a 15, 20 year period. You talk about the kids just having the opportunity to be in their workspace to create art, then what about all of our children having spaces um, of comfort that they can create not only art pieces, but also matriculate through their high school years without being inconvenient on HVAC um, situations throughout the school year. Um, also, as a part of a proposal for Jim Hill High School, um, we're planning to paint the, um, the, paint the school in the second uh, scope of work, also have a new LED lighting um, throughout the school, and address some of the issues that we have from the drainage uh, that causes us to have to replace ceiling tiles uh, now for four years consistently on a week-to-week -week, week -week basis based upon the leaks that happens from the boiler system that transports the warm and cool air to heat and to cool the school. So in my final minute, um, um, speaking on behalf of Jim Hill High School and our community for the HVAC work, um, once again, I would say it would be a mild inconvenience, but the inconvenience that we were in, uh, happened for this upcoming school year would to be able to substantiate um, sustainability and as well as a continuous learning pattern for the next principal and scholars of Jim Hill High School. Thank you. Next is Dr. Valerie Bradley, support of the proposed consolidation and school repairs. I'm a little vertically challenged. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Green, board members, Ms. Thomas. I am Valerie Bradley, principal of Lanier High School, better known as 833 Nation, where we leave the light on. If you stop by any time after 6.30, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I come in support of the uh, reconfiguration of Lanier being a 712 school. Uh, just like Bobby Brown, not only do I work at Lanier, but I'm a community member as well. So I live in the community so for over 50 years without telling my age. I can do that. Um, <clears throat> I've seen the blight of the neighborhood. And so one thing that we do know is that schools support students. And that's how we get funding and all the other stuff that we need. Uh, and because of the neighborhood blight, the student population is shrinking. And it's been shrinking for some time. Uh, and so the Lanier community is the Brinkley community. Those are siblings. And so they share the same houses, the same families. Uh, we've seen um, apartment complexes be tore down. And some of them are under repair. But that puts families out. And so uh, where there are no students, then you're going to have an issue with your schools. And so um, just as we think about the 712 reconfiguration, uh, it will also, as Bobby Brown stated, help us get some much needed repairs onto the school. We have the wing on the school, um, 300, 400 wing, that's empty. And so uh, we are actively anticipating this proposed change. Uh, in anticipation of uh, getting the students, because students have to be educated, no matter where they are. And so we look forward to doing that um, and just educating children to make sure that they're safe and that we can do what we need to do uh, to help them grow. And I was uh, meeting today with some of the staff at Brinkley, and they had some concerns, which people will all the time. But I think this will be a great idea because it will help us help children and when we look at the shrinking population at Brinkley and the shrinking population at Lanier, putting those two together, everybody's afraid that we're going to be a powerhouse. So we're looking forward to being that powerhouse. Absolutely. Thank you. Powerhouse. Next is Erica Scott, who wants to address you regarding Pecan Park. How you doing? Hello. I'm kind of nervous. I don't usually do this much, but when it comes to us parents at Pecan Park, have kids and students at Pecan Park, me, like some of the others, I'm part of Pecan Park community. Me and my husband grew up there. We went to school there in that community, in that area. Now our babies is growing up in that area. A lot of those students in that school parents grew up with us, so we're all together still in that area. We had our meeting last Tuesday. A lot of us parents expressed how we feel, and our children was with us attending that meeting. So we had to go home trying to explain, because the only thing they heard was them being separated. You have families in the Pecan Park splitting up, going to two different areas. We explained how that's an inconvenience on some of us. And we're a tight-knit community over there at Pecan Park, and we stick together. One parent helps the other over there. My daughter is going through the motions right now since we left that meeting. And us parents wrote a letter for you all, and I made a copy for you all to leave here. I was late getting here a little bit from work, but I made it because I want to speak our voice. We asked. Okay, if you're going to move them and do repairs, keep them together at least, students and staff, keep them together. Our babies know that staff. They've been with that staff since pre-K on up until now. And they made and built that bond. And no teachers go above and beyond to not only help us educate our babies, and my babies excel. My son went from a D to an A student, and he suffers from ADHD and takes medication and therapy now. And he's an A and B student now, right now, at Blackburn. And he started from Pecan Park. Now I got a seven-year-old that started from pre-K there, too. And she made the highest score on her benchmark test just recently. And another parent stated how her child was having struggling. My point of making is them teachers know 
our kids in that community, in that area, their weaknesses and their strength, and how to build that bond with them to get them where they need to be. And we just ask if you keep them together throughout this ordeal, and we willing to work with whatever you put in front of us, just keep these kids and the staff together, don't separate them, because that's what they're worrying about right now. Most of parents are thinking about, even though if y'all do it, they're thinking about pulling their kids out of Lake and Johnson. It's not gonna be a good situation either way. So I thank you for your time. I, like I said, I tried to get here earlier. I don't know who to give this to, to give to you all. You can give it to me, man. Yeah. You can give it to me, man. Okay. And okay. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank so you. just think about that and what this from all of us parents and communities can call for. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Dr. Lily Stewart Robinson, proposed consolidation and school repairs. Okay, to the superintendent, Dr. Green, and the school board, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Lily Stewart Robinson. I'm coming today because I'm concerned about the effect that this move will have on the children. We want all the schools to be repaired. They've been in disarray for a long time. But it's the way you are doing it, and it's the speed that you're doing it. And the reason that was given, I was at the Pecan Park meeting, was that if we don't spend this money for uh, 2024, we're going to have to send it back. And that's not even acceptable. Why? Because this money was given to you all a long time ago. So you have enough time to put everything in perspective. Now, one comment was made, I think uh, Assistant Superintendent said that um, the schools has to close in order to do the repairs. Why? I watched you all make repairs at Callaway High School. Y'all put a whole new system. They did that during the summer, and they did it, I guess, on the weekend. I watched that. But I think it would be really disheartening for the students at Lanier to be merged with Brinkley. You're not from Mississippi, you're not from Jackson. Powell and Brinkley were the schools that was knitted together. Roanne and Lanier was the school that was knitted together. So if you come and mix them together, it's not gonna, be, it's not gonna turn out well. It's not gonna turn out well at all. So I, we need the uh, schools to be repaired, and I'm number one. Because one day I passed by Wilkins, and I don't know if it's open or not, but I literally cried at the condition of that school. We want the schools repaired, but I'm just saying, just like the lady said, why separate these siblings from their oldest uh, brothers and sisters? Why don't you, okay, some going to Lake, some going to Johnson. Take a family, several families to go to Lake with their sibling, take some to go to Johnson with their sibling. Okay, so I just want to bring that out because Jackson has been dumped on too much this year from the state, from the city, with the garbage, with the water, and now for our children to be exposed to this, we got to hurry up and get this done. If you have money, I really believe this, if you have money to spend, you can get enough uh, contractors to do this work over the summer. So I, you know, I uh, applaud you all for wanting to get it done, but you waited to the last, the ninth hour. And I hope that you would consider not separating the siblings and not merging seventh graders, eighth graders with Lanier High School, because it's not gonna work. And we wanna see peace in this city. We don't wanna see turmoil. So if you all would consider that when you all get ready to vote, I appreciate it so much because, and I'm getting ready to sit down, 100% of the, they said 100% of the students, well not quite 100% because you got Callaway area and other areas are in a disadvantaged economic situation. Many so consider that. Up. Thank you. Next is Dr. Ruby Funches, renaming of Powell Middle School. I think it says back to Brinkley School. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, 
is to the superintendent and the board members and all who are present here today. I am Ruby Purnell Funches. I graduated from Brinkley High School. I started out as an elementary school student at Brinkley. I was promoted from kindergarten to third grade, but my mother had twins in the third grade, so I had to go to second grade. However, I matriculated through Brinkley. Brinkley is the, the first Brinkley is the building that houses Walton School. And Powell is the building that was built for us. That is our dearest Brinkley Junior Senior High School. And we would like to have our name restored. We don't want our name to just die out. Brinkley was only a high school for 10 years. In that time, Brinkley produced people who became Supreme Court justices, people who became United States Marshals, people who became medical doctors, corporate attorneys, entrepreneurs, and me. I am a former teacher, but I'm always an educator. I am retired. I worked at Powell. I was a cheerleader there. I'm still a cheerleader for Powell, mm. but it's Brinkley to me. It'll mm. always be Brinkley. And I was so disheartened when I went there and noticed how badly it needed repairs. I'm thankful that it will receive the repairs, and hopefully we will celebrate my class, the Brinkley class of 1964. Hopefully we will celebrate our 60th year anniversary next June when the school will have been repaired. And we'll have Brinkley's name back on the side of the building. So that is my plea, 3655 Livingston Road from 3600 Baylor Avenue to 3655 Livingston Road, Jackson, Mississippi. I'm a Verdon edition, baby. <laughs> Next is Cornelius Thompson, who wants to address you regarding restoring the name of Brinkley School back to the original building at 3655 Livingston Road. Good evening, uh, Dr. Green, the board. I'm just going to reiterate what uh, Dr. Funches said. That's home for us, and we want to go home. As she said, we went to Brinkley all our lives from elementary. They built a new school, and we are the, the, the site on the hill. And we want our name back on our school. Uh, as you do all the changes and stuff, we're not kicking against that. We hope you are successful with it. So it shouldn't be hard to reassign a name to an area, to a school that's well deserving. So we ask you to really consider that. We would appreciate it. We want to go home. Next is Lee Bernard, Lanier support of merging with Brinkley. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Bernard, and I came in support of the merge of Lanier High School and Brinkley High School. I attended Lanier from 1962 to 1968, so I've been in that environment where we have seventh through the twelfth grade, and we are looking forward to going back to a junior senior high school. So as you consider the merger and making it a junior senior high school, please vote in the affirmative. Again, I thank you for allowing me to come before you. Thank you. Board members, you have one other person who signed up to address you this evening, but you'll be listening to her in executive session. Thank you. Now we are at information items only and our student board presentations from Lanier High School. Lakeisha Marshall-Thomas, Assistant Superintendent for High Schools. Great evening, Dr. Yeah. Green, Dr. Luckett, board members. So in the spirit of student voices, um, 
We will have our student school board representative, Willie Jones III from Lanier High School. Willie is a senior. He is a member of the Lanier Boys Basketball Team, the Student Government Association. He's also enrolled in several AP courses at Lanier. Um, Willie will attend Mississippi State University and major in computer science. Um, good evening, school board and Dr. Green. My name is Willie Jones III, and I am the Lanier High School representative, school board representative. Today, I will pre be presenting about the school, um, the JPS dropout pre prevention policy, and how much I just support it. Um, to just dive into it. Each school district child implement a dropout prevention program approved by the Office of Dropout Prevention of the State Department of Education by the 2012-2013 and annu annually thereafter school year. Each local school district will be held responsible for reducing and eliminating dropouts in the district. The local school district will be responsible for implementation of dropout plans focus focusing on issues such as, but not limited to, dropout prevention initiatives that focus on the needs of individual local education agencies, establishing policies and procedures that meet the needs of the districts, focusing on student-centered goals and objectives that are measurable, strong emphasis on reducing the retention rates in grades kindergarten, first, and second targeting subgroups that need additional assistance that meet graduation requirements and dropout recovery initiatives that focus on students age 17 through 21 that dropped out of school. So, where do we classify as a dropout? A dropout is categorized as a scholar who leaves school before graduation or completion of their program. I chose to research this board policy because at Lanier High School, Dropout prevention is a very big deal. And our graduation coach, Mrs. Michael, is a beast <laughs> when it comes to ensuring that we graduate with our cohort of students that we came in with. Amen. I know he's an important factor for Jackson Public Schools and I can see firsthand the process at Lanier High School. Just for some insight and statistics on this, on dropout prevention, According to recent U.S. Department of Education, or USDOE, publication, Dropout Prevention, a practice guide, each year more than half a million young people drop out of high school and at the rate at which they drop, and at the, and at the rate at which they drop out has remained the same for the last 30 years, even as spending on education has increased significantly. For society as a whole, helping young people stay in and complete high school is a worthwhile effort that impacts the lives of so many young people. Some things that we use to identify that are dropped, some, some potential dropouts and traits that they have are poor attendance, low grades, number of suspensions, and number of grade retentions. Um, some, and what we do to, um, Find, to identify these traits are monitor daily attendance records, monitor and track disciplinary referrals, monitor and track current academic grades, refer to counselors or behavioral specialists, screen students for, and screen students for skill deficiency and strengths. Um, some intervention that we use are monitoring daily attendance records to develop intervention plans and support, monitor and track disciplinary referrals to provide research-based information interventions, monitor and track current academic grades to provide research-based interventions and remediation. Uh, we also refer to counselors or behavioral specialists for counseling services and support. And we also screen stu students very often throughout the year with the STAR, with the STAR test. Just to put a name on some of these, on some of the people who take, um, these actions, 
um, do these? Are the REAP program we have for JPS or re-engaging in education for all to progress? Some of our graduation coaches at all high schools, credit recovery and initial credit options. And also, for some situations, home visits are needed. At Lanier High School, we will implement every part of the JPS dropout prevention policy. Ultimately, our goal is to ensure that every student graduates with their cohort of students that they came in with. We communicate with the student, parent, and any family member that can assist us with getting the, scho with getting the scholar back to Lanier and back on track to graduate. The graduation coach goes to homes, places of work, or any known location that can assist us with getting the scholar to return to school and re-engage to meet graduation requirements and plan for post-secondary uh, plans, such as enrollment, employment, or, or enlistment. Um, and just for some statistics, you can see from 2017 to 2020, Lanier had a steady graduation rate from the, low, the high 50s to the low 60s. But in these last three years, we have made a, a significant jump. In 2021, we jumped up to 71.3% on the graduation rate. In 2022, 81.0%. And this year, 83.8%. <laughs> Um, any questions or comments? Thank you, Mr. Jones. That was great. We Thank really you for appreciate having you uh, being here. Um, my fellow board members, do you have any questions or comments for Mr. Jones? Hold on one second. We'll <laughs> these guys might <laughs> Moving too might have, have might actually have something for you. <laughs> board. I have a question. Um, your presentation was great. Um, what do you think is the most effective um, method? Um, building a relationship with every student, I think that's the, the number one thing. Okay. That's good. That's all. All right, my name is Willie Jones III. Thank you for having me. <laughs> before you go, before you go, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, before you go. <laughs> <laughs> Like any other politician, thank you so much, and you're racing to your seat. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for this. Hold on, brother. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> my father, I thought you pointed me to my seat. No, 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 I would never. Um, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. You know, so often we have young people um, share some of the policies that they believe need to be changed. So I appreciate you lifting up one that you think is working or, or we've got some data to show that it's working. So, and thank you for sharing that data. I think that really drove home the earlier points that you made. Something that I've been wondering, and, and this is a, a very real kind of wondering that I have, um, you know, we talk a lot about what adults are doing to identify and monitor and track and building relationships with, uh, with scholars. Do you think there's any, any strength or, um, or, yeah, we'll say any strength in facilitating and encouraging scholars to have some mutual accountability with one another? Because I know for a fact, oftentimes we're checking in with scholars. Hey, have you seen Willie? Oh yeah, he's working at such and such. He said he needed to work, or whatever is the case with your your peers. Is there is that you think that would be effective at all if we tr tried to help you all, or if there was some way for you all to kind of hold one another accountable more and encourage and I don't know. I think just. Considering certain things like cool, like handling your business, we consider that the cool thing. We want, we want you to think about your future. What you do now is gonna make your future easier. Yeah. So, and we see somebody slacking, we not encouraging that. We not clapping for them. We just we don't we don't we don't like that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I wanna. Um, I appreciate that. I wanna keep thinking about um, about that sort of thing. There's there's. I, I do know that there's a difference in what you hear and what you carry with you from adults versus what you hear and where, what you carry with you from your peers. So if there's a way for us to support that, I, I want to think some more about it. Yes, yeah. Thank you. 
<laughs> and I'm going to Tougaloo, not Mississippi State. All right. Come on, hey. Tougaloo. Congratulations. <laughs> and they're lucky to have you. <laughs> That's an important clarification. <laughs> they are lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jones. That was great. Uh, information item, uh, information only item B, bond ESSER update, Sandra Robinson, Executive Director, Facilities and Operations. Ms. Robinson. Good evening, board members. Good evening. So at the first board meeting of each month, I have the pleasure of providing the bond update. In tonight's presentation, we will provide an update on the baseball softball field, um, one of our last major projects with the bond, the bond financial report update, ESSER updates, and also um, just to um, give you as information our construction quality control pro protocols. At the baseball softball field at the Hardy Hughes complex, we are now installing sod sidewalks and the ex exterior lighting installation is in progress. The bond, as of April 21st, we've expended or encumbered 95% of the funds. The amount expended increased from 87.5% to 88.2% since the April 4th um, update to the board. Um, as you see in the orange, it, it, uh, it accounts for the amount expended. That's over $64 million expended. Um, the gray has the amount encumbered, so we have about $5 million encumbered, and yet to be and the amount unencumbered is about $3 million. The next three slides give a school-by-school -school accounting of the projects. And on this last slide, again, we're going to look at the budget of $72 million, expended about $65 million, encumbered $5 million, and budget balance of $3 million. And just to, to remind residents, since we have a big crowd here tonight of the projects that we did with these funds, we are thankful for those residents of Jackson who voted for the bond in 2018. We've been able to do athletic improvements at, at Hughes Field with um, much needed improvements there. At Jim Hill, Callaway, and at Forest Hill, we were able to renovate the coliseums, the gyms there. Um, at um, our High schools, we were able to upgrade our science labs. And at our uh, high schools also, we were up, up, able to upgrade our libraries. So we have really done a lot of work with that $65 million and with a, an additional $7 million in interest we've earned. So going from bonds to ESSER. So we have had a lot of facility challenges over the years, and we continue to do it. So that $72 million was only a dent in what we needed. We're been able to utilize the ESSER funds to do some additional much needed improvements. Wingfield Crawl Space Repairs is one project that we're going to be completing at Wingfield um, to fulfill an MDE cap requirement. So there are some existing water drainage problems under the building that's going to be resolved. We have issued the notice to proceed, so that work is going to start um, as soon as school dismisses in May. Uh, Wells APAC restroom renovations, those are much needed. The contracts have been ex executed, and today we had our pre-construction meeting. At Powell, John Hopkins, and Pecan Park, those bids have been awarded. Uh, window replacements at Powell, restroom renovations at Powell. John Hopkins renovating the restrooms, carpet removal, and some HVAC upgrades. Pecan Park, HVAC upgrades, drainage and structural improvements, and envelope replacement. And I know there was a comment about um, the need to do this, if we could do this over the summer. So one of the um, things that happened when we had the bond, at Callaway, um, we had COVID. Initially, the project was bid to do evenings and weekends. When COVID hit, the buildings were empty. It was, we were able to accelerate that work and get that work done. Right now with ESSER funds, every school district in the country has access to the ESSER dollars. What that means, everybody is ordering the same thing at the same time. One of the things with ESSER, you're able to improve indoor air quality. And with that, you're able to upgrade your HVAC systems. Right now, we're experiencing a lead time of over a year on some equipment. So to be able to do these projects over the summer, it's really impossible at this point. So we're starting the, the lead work, the demolition, and then placing those, those orders for equipment. And so really by late spring is where we're going to get some of the equipment to do that fi final installation. 
other projects, Boyd, Green, and Lake, doing some window replacements there. Um, that bid was awarded. Um, we're in the contract phase. Um, Lake, Smith, and Wingfield window replacements. We had to reject that bid. With some of the projects we're seeing that um, with the um, volume of work with all the school districts, um, some contracts are, are just throwing money at it and escalating their prices above what is reasonable. So some projects we are having to reject because of the um, absorbent amount that they're bidding. Mm. Witten restroom renovations, that bid was awarded. April uh, 18th, we're in contract phase there. Jim Hill renovations, renovating the entire main building, new lights, new ceilings. Bailey APAC, new roof, HVAC and restroom renovations. And board uh, elementary renovations. We'll, we'll be re renovating the restrooms there and doing some additional HVAC upgrades. And all of, um, the first three projects are um, the first two are in contract phase. Um, Bailey APAC is on tonight's ag agenda for um, bid approval. And next month, we will have the board project on the, on the agenda for bid, bid approval. A few more projects on next board meeting for um, recommendation are the green HVAC replacements, lake renovations that will include HVAC and restroom renovations, Walton HVAC and restroom renovations, McLeod. Um, restroom renovations, that will be the gang toilets and classroom toilets and the exterior door replacements. Wingfield, restroom and HVAC improvements, Lester, restroom renovations, Sykes, staff and toilet, um, toilet upgrades and HVAC replacements and at Wilkin, HVAC replacements. Now the um, they will be on the May 16th board. Some of them will be bid awards recommendation and some will be bid rejection recommendations. Um, at some of the um, schools, we got some feedback that um, some of the quality wasn't um, what they thought. Um, but we wanted to ensure all the residents, um, students and staff that we do have bid award quality control protocols in place. In compliance with state and federal bid laws, we evaluate all responding bidders on their price and determine the lowest and best. Just because you're low to, does not mean that you're the best contractor. What we do, we check the references thoroughly and ensure contractors have su successfully completed similar scope projects. In the bond, we did award to a few smaller contracts and what we, contractors, and what we have found that if they didn't have that similar scope in their resume already, already they struggled to, to complete those projects. So we're making sure with ESSER that those contracts that are awarded to contractors that have work done in similar scope. On the construction quality control protocols, the design firm, that is the architect, is responsible for biweekly construction inspections. So that's twice a week on all projects that are in progress. And also, um, the JPS staff, we also go out and, and make sure projects are going um, according to, um, to standards. We do not pay until um, we are in concurrence on, on the work that is performed. At substantial completion, the design firm verifies that all systems are installed properly and are operational. At the conclusion of the um, project, we do do a punch list, and that's a deficiency list that outlines all remaining work that the contractor, project manager, or district um, personnel identifies that needs to be done. After substantial completion, the contractor has 30 days to complete all punch list items. And after project completion, the contractor has one year warranty period to, to correct any failed work. And in the, in the event that we still have some issues with that contractor, so we are going to still hold that payment, we do have the right to pursue the contractor's performance bond for all work that's not completed to the specified standards and when we have pursued contractors with their performance bond before. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Board, do you have any questions? I had one question on the materials. Page five and seven are the same. I noticed that I <laughs> will get the right one. Ms. Robinson, I'm really excited to see this and to see where we are and to see how 
we're ready to move from bond into to ESSER. It's just going to be a new day for JPS and for our students and for these facilities. And I'm really excited that the bond from 2018 that, you know, roughly 96% of it has been spent or is encumbered to be spent. I remember when the board was out stumping for this thing in 2018, there was community concerns that we wouldn't be able to do this and get it done. And boy, this is exciting. So thank you um, and thanks to all of the team at JPS and everyone who's been working so hard to get this done. I believe we also have a question from Dr. Sivak. Thank, thank you, Dr. Luckett. Um, Ms. Robinson, thank you for the um, very helpful report. Um, when we were out at meetings um, last week, uh, there were some concerns that were raised over at Jim Hill, specifically around ductwork in the library and with the restrooms. Um, what's the process for um, uh, bringing those back online or ensuring the work was done properly, and if not, um, ensuring that, that we're not paying for work that wasn't done properly. Yes, so um, as far as the protocols, we do um, um, have the architect make sure all the systems are operational before we um, issue a substantial completion punch list. So at Jim Hill, at the time when the project was completed, all restrooms were operational. So what we're doing now, we are going to go back and see what's wrong. Um, I think there was one male restroom that is reported to be leaking and making sure that there may be a maintenance issue with that pipe. But we still are um, holding some um, funds for that contractor, so we're going to make sure that um, if it is a contractor installation problem, we have that funds available to take it from their remaining um, balance. But if it is a maintenance issue, that we will um, um, complete it with district maintenance funds. It, and, and while you're out there, is the duct work, have you heard of the duct work issue in the library? I did. Um, it was a space that, honestly, um, a room behind a room, and it wasn't ducted uh, during that process of the library. But with this um, HVAC replacement, that area will have um, the, the, the duct work installed. Great, thank you. Um, these, with these reports coming in each month, um, can you add an update to the Jim Hill issues for the next month's report, just so we can get a sense of where things are with that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Robinson. Now we're on to information only item C, review of the resolution naming Lanier Basketball Court, Thomas Billups Court. Coach Daryl Jones, Executive Director of Athletics. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. School board, Dr. Green, colleagues, and community members. Uh, the athletic department is in, is in the process of refinishing the floor at Lanier High School. Um, the basketball coaches and administration at Lanier High School came up with the idea of naming the court after coach Thomas J. J. Billups, who was the boys basketball coach at Lanier High School for 22 years and winning eight state, state championships. <laughs> um, the, uh, Mr. Al Thomas, uh, president of the Lanier National Alumni Association and the Lanier National uh, Alumni Association supports this effort. Um, as far as budgetary costs, uh, we are refinishing the floor anyway, so it's just a, a matter of just putting his signature on the floor, which I don't know what it's going to cost, maybe 25 or $30, mm -hmm. but we re we're doing the floor anyway, <laughs> so it's not a big deal. Uh, district commitment, we want to always uh, find a way to honor our coaches in the past that have exhibited excellence. Um, so this is a way that we can honor Coach Billups uh, and his tenure at Lanier High School. Board members, any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Coach Jones. Thank you. Information only, item D, review of the rental agreement between Jackson State University and the Jackson Public School District for the annual JPS convocation. Dr. William Merritt, Chief of Staff. Great evening to uh, Dr. Luckett, Board of Trustees, Dr. Green, and JPS family. 
Uh, the administration is requesting the review of the rental agreement between Jackson State University and Jackson Public School District for the annual convocation to be held Friday, August the 4th, 2023. Board, any questions? <laughs> Gotta have it. <laughs> Not hearing any, thank you very much. Thank you. Information only action, uh, information only item E, review of renewal agreements, reconstruction, Greater Jackson Arts Council, Jackson Medical Mall Foundation, Genesis and Light, to teach and roll. There's a whole bunch of them on here. Um, uh, Dr. Samisha Stokes, Executive Director, Office of Innovative Strategy. Dr. Stokes. Good evening. To President mm -hmm. Tvac, Superintendent Green, board members, and JPS family, good evening. The administration is recommending the renewal of project agreements for summer programming, whereas the Jackson Public School District plans to host an in-person free summer enrichment camp from June the 5th through June the 30th, 2023, for pre-K to 12th grade scholars. The A3 summer enrichment camp will open at 14 sites from 7.30 to 3 for elementary scholars, 8 to 3.30 for middle school scholars, and 8.30 to 4 for high school scholars. The projected enrollment for the 19-day enrichment camp is 2,815 plus scholars, respectively. The morning will be academic focused with engaging lessons and activities aligned with essential lessons and activities that scholars will need to be successful for the upcoming school year. For example, as an academic program, the Mississippi Children's Museum will participate in the summer school program through its annual Read to Succeed camp. The district has partnered with the Mississippi Children's Museum for the past seven years in this camp. This program supports third grade scholars who are not successful on their first attempt to obtain a passing score on the third grade reading gate. Through a week long camp, June the 12th through the 16th, the Mississippi Children's Museum will serve scholars attending Boyd Elementary School for the A3 summer camp. With one week of exposure to the camp, 25% of 50 students passed the third grade gate assessment last year. Mm -hmm. The after school, the um, afternoon rather, will be enrichment focused with a combination of offerings which may include visual performing arts, sports, academic clubs, and community service. We rely on contracted partners to facilitate creative, dynamic programming that aligns with and supports schools' instructional programs and accelerate learning. For an example of the summer enrichment for rising sixth grade scholars, we will have a band camp that will be offered to our middle school scholars. Retired and current band directors will facilitate this opportunity for advancing band programming with fun, creative, and engaging music activities. Uh, Jackson Public School bus transportation and meals will be provided for all participating JPS scholars. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. Board members, any questions? Excuse me, Dr. Stokes. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, my board constituents uh, in the past have spoken of um, reading lists coming out in the summer, the books that JPS recommends our scholars read. Does that fall under your office or another office? And is that something we could find on the web page that I could find and share that with my Yes, ma'am, with all due respect. The books that our students are required to read, their summer reading books, it's that information is posted on our district web page. And I would be totally remiss if I did not celebrate Dr. Mitchell Shears, who from Jackson State University, who will be providing summer reading books for all JPS students for the 8th grade summer camp. Oh, that's yes. wonderful. Thank you. We do have in the audience, if you will please stand, Mr. JSU representative joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited. Yes. Kudos to Dr. Shears. You're welcome, anytime. Thank you, Dr. Stokes. And it's always great to hear about such robust programming for our kids in the summers so, and, and all the time. So thank you for all the work that you and your team do. Thank you as well. And as always, thank you for your leadership. Now, information only item F, update on the plan for temporary school relocations. Dying. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luckett. Uh, as, as I noted um, during my remarks and, and committed, 
at our last board meeting, the April 18th board meeting. I'm coming back to you with some updates on um, the, the temporary relocation planning um, and, and the plans for that, as well as just to provide a little bit more information regarding the ESER um, funding. Always we like to begin with and ground in our vision and mission um, and the core values that we've named uh, to drive our work. Um, and I'm hopeful that you'll find in this presentation and in this body of work, these bodies of work, all of the core values uh, listed there or, or, or um, impacted there. So uh, in the next few minutes, and I won't take up too much of your time because we've already gone, we've already shared the relocation plans. Uh, so this is really um, to update and to address and to um, uh, um, near, zero in on some of the additional information I think that folks uh, might find useful. Want to um, really just underscore that the driving force between or behind the temporary relocations as well as the two proposals that are before you board members regarding um, Baker and Lanier and, and um, Brinkley. Um, the driving force behind those is really three things. There's a huge need, significant need, and you've heard that over and over for, from folks. You've seen um, some of the work that we've done through bond uh, funding and, and some of the continued work there, um, and we know that, that we've just got some major needs in our facilities. So a need for significant investments in our facilities as well. We have the availability of these ESER funds, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief ESER funds. And so we have those dollars available to us. Again, to recall, and, and, and as you'll recall, we don't actually get a check from the federal government. Those funds are uh, with the state and we submit for reimbursement. So we must first spend the money and then get reimbursed for those projects. And Again, obviously, that means you must have the money to spend it first. And so we've got to be mindful of, of our, uh, our cash flow in order to spend that money, get the reimbursement, and continue with our operations. So just naming that. And then lastly, the established timeline for, the, for those funds. And I'll say a little more about the, the amount of funds that we've gotten and the timeline of those funds and even the timeline for our planning and go into that in a moment. Just again to ground though, uh, we talked previously about our declining enrollment, want to put that in front of you. Um, and just to, to, because there's really small font there. We started in 2014, 2015, that school year with uh, about 28,778 scholars. And this school year we have uh, 18,874 scholars. And so just want to keep that information in front of you as we're thinking about strategic and, and significant investments in our buildings and our facilities. We've got to be mindful of who will be in those buildings or who should be in those buildings and the monies that um, can help us to ensure that folks are safe and, and comfortable in those, in those facilities. So to the uh, ESER funding, and timelines. You may call board members and to our community members. There were three rounds of funding. The first, ESER 1, um, the allocation uh, in that first round was $12.4 million. We expended all of those dollars and then some. But we expended all of those dollars and we had to expend them by uh, September 30th of last year. So that's done. Those dollars were spent. In the second round of ESER funding, we, we were allocated $49,549,000 and, and $200. We've expended to date 32, about 32 million, just over 32 million. So that remaining 17 or so million dollars, we must expend or obligate by September the 30th of this year. So we've got only a few months, but you know, we've got Tons of projects already happening, and as they come in and, and we're ready to get our money back, um, we, we are not concerned about that. But the team is working hard to ensure that we're using the funds that are available and per the, the criteria 
for those funds um, based on the, the, the funding round. And then in ESER 3, also known as the American Recovery Plan Act, um, we were allocated $108,969,693. Of that, we've expended to date uh, about $21.5 million, and we have until September 30th of next year to expend, of, of 2024, to expend those dollars. Again, we've got more than enough work to do. The challenge will be in um, ensuring that the, uh, the bids that come in, that they're bid uh, appropriately based on the, the cost of those projects, and that we're able to move through that process and co contracting process, and that we have availability to all of the facilities. Those for which we've, um, we're planning to move scholars from in order to do the work and all of the other buildings, and you saw much of that from Ms. Robinson's presentation, um, that we're able to do those projects either on weekends, after school, and over the summer and, and during breaks. So lots of work happening, um, and I should also uh, underscore, we're utilizing uh, a significant amount of our ESER funding, and especially the ESER 3, funding for facilities work as is allowed uh, through the Fed or by the federal government um, to the tune of about $66 million to address uh, um, some facilities issues. But that also means that those are funds that we're not using for after school and summer school and uh, other kinds of academic uh, remediation. These are choices we've had to make it's an opportunity we have to address some, some needed uh, or some, some really important and significant uh, upgrades in our buildings, but just want to keep that in front of us that uh, while we are committing these dollars, that means that we're not committing them in some other ways. I should end that with, and we're still continuing to improve our um, scholars' achievement. So there's that too. Right, uh, board members, the um, just listing out here some of the, the highest anticipated construction costs. This again is not all of the projects, not all of the schools, you saw many others there, but uh, some of the highest dollar amounts. At Bailey, um, we have, and we're, we, we're bringing back to you, I believe at the next board meeting, significant uh, construction work there. We're excited about it, but also excited to get those scholars back there and, and to do the work that uh, we've been discussing and bringing together our um, Wells APAC scholars and Bailey scholars in that building. You'll recall that that's a commitment we made to uh, service all those scholars in the, in the expanded and improved, renovated Bailey building. So, uh, to the tune of about $20 million. And at Jim Hill, uh, about $9 million or, or over $9 million, over $9 million at Pecan Park, nearing 10. Um, about $2.5 million at, at Powell, and, and more if we're able, as we're able to um, identify additional pots of, of dollars to, to invest in that building. Uh, there's certainly more need there, but we'll able to do quite a bit in terms of addressing some of the major needs, and you saw some of that uh, foundation and HVAC and, and some other things at Powell. Again, these, this is not all, this is not an exhaustive list, but wanted to just put those in front of you as we talk about some of the major projects that are happening and um, uh, areas where scholars are being displaced. And you'll recall, even with Bailey, those scholars have been displaced and, and for some time while we've amassed the dollars in order to do the work that's needed in that building. So uh, we've heard a lot about, and even tonight, uh, comments about us waiting to the last minute to do the work and why didn't you start earlier and, and that sort of thing. So we thought we'd spend a, a few minutes talking about that. Um, in the, the, with the bond project and, and in support of the bond projects, we did uh, quite a bit of planning there and identifying various needs in our buildings and, and uh, things that needed to be addressed and very quickly got to the end of those dollars. <laughs> we very quickly ran out of those bond dollars in order to, to address all of those projects. Well, we've been able to pick up those projects to address them in using some of these ESER dollars. 
And so from some of that planning, even back then, and updated planning as well, uh, we went out to divine, divine, I'm sorry, design firms um, to contract them for uh, helping us to design the work, the projects that are happening now. So that happened in June of last year, June of last year. That process has continued in, in, uh, and that de design phase con uh, starting in earnest in July and continuing really to the start of this year in the bid phase for these projects. Again, we're not talking about replacing um, a, a water cooler or, or air conditioner in your home. These are major projects that require design work and engineering work. And so the bid phase uh, started in January and, and contracting and construction, as you see there, March and, and May. So I wanted to, again, share a bit more of that because I think for folks who aren't doing this work, it's easy to assume that we waited until now to get started with this. We did not. We did not. This work is continuing. As you saw earlier, even in the bid phase, just because we put a bid out there, that doesn't mean that we get back the bids that will work for our budget and, and that are realistic. The, this is a, a time where contractors, they're not hurting for work. They've got more work than they can shake a stick at, as folks would say. And so uh, we're having to work with contractors to, to get bids back and and um, to, to engage folks who are actually capable of doing the work uh, in the projects that we have here. Um, I'm gonna go, go through this and see if folks have questions. We can come back around if you have any questions about any of this. But I did wanna spend a, a few minutes talking about the, the planning timeline. Just to quickly go through, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just wanted to give you a sense of some of the work that is happening in the, those larger uh, projects and especially those where we uh, see the need to displace our scholars and team members. We've got a, a mechanical system upgrade. We've got new ceilings, ground floor, floor reconfiguration to accommodate the fourth and fifth graders from Wales APAC, the full roof replacement, uh, restrooms, cafeteria uh, work happening, restroom renovations, uh, several other things. There's a, some drainage issues, fire suppression system, all of those things happening at Bailey. Of course, with that $20 million price tag, you can understand several things are happening there. And we're excited to do it, but it's obviously costly. At Jim Hill, there are two big projects there, uh, the mechanical system upgrade. We've got new ceilings and LED. Uh, lighting uh, for the corridors. We've got window, window replacements, additional restroom renovations, and some in other interior upgrades. Uh, that major, I, I kind of moved quickly through that first one, that, that complete mechanical system upgrade moving from a two-pipe to a four-pipe system. It's not just replacing what's there. It's totally changing out the uh, HVAC system that's in this high school, which is obviously pretty large. And so this requires us to operate differently. And I want to underscore what was stated, that what uh, Ms. Robinson stated earlier. So for those who may have missed it or, or are holding on to the fact that we were able to work on uh, um, Callaway while school was in session, we actually were able to do a lot of that work while scholars were not in the building. And I will remind for those who were living or working or learning in the building, there were lots of concerns about that building as we were bringing scholars back at the start of the year. This isn't ready. We shouldn't be bringing them back. Lots of concerns about it. And so while the major work was completed before they came back in the building, there were concerns about the continued work uh, that happened after we brought scholars back. We don't want to repeat that. We can't repeat that. We don't need scholars inhaling dust and all that sort of thing as we're working through these buildings. So there's that. The con park, some of the uh, major aspects of the renovations there, the mechanical system, restrooms, new ceilings, more drainage work, staircase replacement. There's some uh, pretty important foundational work that needs, to be, that needs to happen there. And I'm actually excited that we'll be able to do some of the exterior facade uh, upgrades. So that, that school will, will look, you will see 
the changes, the upgrades to the school uh, as we uh, prepare to bring the scholars back after the work is done. And then at Powell, uh, again, two major projects, the window replacements and additional restroom renovations, and then some really important structural repairs. You can actually see some of the cracks in the floors at, at Powell, and so we've got to do that. It's interior lighting and, and floor, flooring upgrades at Powell. So uh, at the last meeting, I committed to coming back to you and sharing some of the things that we heard from uh, parents and community members. You heard some of that here tonight. You, many of you board members were able to join us for the, those uh, parent and community meetings. We held them at Baker, at Pecan Park, Jim Hill, and Lanier uh, over the past week. We also had media advisories dis disseminated, and so we've had coverage over the, throughout the past week. I know I've seen several media uh, uh, pieces highlighting these uh, uh, plans that we've put, be put before you as well. We've been posting on social media and on our website plans, the, the PowerPoint from our last board meeting, a video, a couple of videos of me talking about that work. So just wanted to share some of the ways that we've got the word out there. So what have we heard? Um, there were several things that we've heard, several concerns just about moving scholars and, and, and lots of things. Some of the things you heard again this evening, and I'm excited that we're able to come back to you with uh, some changes, some revisions we've made to those relocation plans that I know folks will be pleased to, to learn about. One, we're committed not to split siblings up. Siblings will attend one school either um, which one of the schools slated to receive those scholars. That's a no-brainer. We, we, I'm, I'm glad we were able to address that, and, and we have some numbers from the, from the schools that will be displaced for a time to have some sense of what this will look like. The team will continue to work with school leaders uh, and with parents to, to get those scholars, the, those families, placed together at one or the other school. But, that's, that's something we'll be able to address, and I'm, I'm excited that we're able to do that. We also heard from our parents of our rising ninth graders uh, who would have been uh, rising ninth graders from Northwest who would have been remaining at Northwest. They said, no, 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 we want our scholars in high school. It's time for them to be in high school and uh, we want them together with their peers. And so we went back with the team and Bob, uh, Mr. Brown, Principal Brown was here er earlier was here earlier um, and, and heard from him, other team members, and they walk the, the space. They're able to accommodate all of the ninth graders at Jim Hill. Even as they're displaced out of the main building, they're able to accommodate them in the ninth grade academy building. Uh, that will have uh, uh, far less work uh, conducted in that building. So we're excited to keep them whole there in that general area and the team is confident that they'll be able to serve them and, and uh, to alleviate this concern from families. One other thing that we heard uh, from some of the families of, of those scholars who are being displaced for this next year in order to do these significant renovations was, uh, had I known this was going to happen, I might have in, uh, applied for my scholar to attend one of the uh, special program schools. And so we're reopening the application for the families at Isabel and Pecan Park so that they will at least have an opportunity, if they haven't before, to apply for those programs. I want to reiterate though, these are special program and these are application schools with criteria. And so the scholars who meet the criteria and where there is space, those scholars will be able to, um, we're, we're making allowances for those scholars to attend those special programs. Um, but we're happy to do that and, and yeah, to the extent that that relieves some concern or pressure from, from families, we're, we're offering that. The last thing, again, we heard this evening, and I was so glad that we have a response for this. 
Uh, there is some ability for us to intentionally assign some familiar adults from the sending schools, the schools that are being displaced, to assign some of those team members with scholars at those schools. And so uh, obviously we can't just remove somebody from the school that's receiving scholars, but we will have vacancies. There are opportunities for some of those familiar adults to travel with their scholars to the receiving school. And so uh, that's something that our team is already working through and, and um, working with those team members to make sure that they land, that they are comfortable where they will be, and that scholars will um, be able to see some smiling faces of people that they know. So I wanted to share these. Again, uh, we know that, that there's been concern, and, and rightfully so. We're uh, grateful for families and community members coming out and talking with us and sharing this feedback, allowing us to go back and uh, make some revisions where, where possible. And, uh, and thank you to the team as well for, for uh, going back to the drawing board in, in this regard and being able to address some of these concerns. Amen. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to share. We've we've heard some concerns about um, about um, enrollment in our schools, and so I wanted to share some of that information as well. So uh, you know, we we've said before, and and I think it's probably widely known that that we've had some major declines in enrollment at Lanier High School. Um, we, we are very concerned about operating schools that are seriously under-enrolled. And as a result of the work that we're doing, so I want to make this point very clearly to you board members and to our community members, as a result of the, the significant work that we're doing in several of our buildings, um, Lanier and this uh, this idea, this proposal of reconfiguring, reconfiguring Lanier, um, this, it presents an opportunity for us to move with this now. That conversation about reconfiguration, that had been, has been floated and discussed amongst the folks who are working on the community schools um, uh, approach. And so as a way to address that and as a way to shore up the high school, that conversation has been happening for some time. We're moving this proposal up to you board members now because as you know, adjacent to this uh, proposal is the plan to move Powell scholars from their building into the Brinkley building and to do the major work at Powell. Right, so that's how this conversation is, has been brought forth right now. But we absolutely are excited about this. It's time to move on, and we've got some of the community schools pieces happening, staffing around that, funding for that to provide for resources for families. So wanted to just name that. As well, uh, we've had questions about, oh, uh, and so um, just so you know, the, the enrollment uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the title is wrong, but the capacity at Lanier. Um, the current enrollment is 603. The capacity is for 1,460 scholars. And so questions about whether or not we can support all of the uh, scholars from the Lanier High School and the um, incoming 7th uh, and 8th graders from Brinkley, there's no question we can support them at Lanier. And to do so in a way where they're not uh, right up on top of each other and, and, and right there together. At Pecan Park, we had questions about uh, enrollment and so wanted to, to share um, a little bit about that. We've got um, the Pecan Park babies. Uh, there are 470 of them at Pecan Park and so uh, we, as we looked across the district, there's no building that is suitable to receive them that could receive all 470 of the scholars. That's why we had to go to this split um, plan. We would love to have kept them all together in one place. We simply do not have a building that could receive all of the scholars. But we can by um, uh, splitting the pre-K through or, or K through second and then third through fifth 
and by addressing the sibling issue, we can support them all at Lake and, Lake and, and Johnson elementaries. And then with regard to, to Isabel, uh, again, unfortunately, Isabel is being displaced as Lanier uh, is moving out of their space for, for renovations. There are 267 scholars at Isabel, and we could not move them all to one building uh, and not have major concerns about overcrowding. And so uh, there again, by uh, sending the younger scholars to Leicester and the older scholars to uh, Marshall, we'll be able to serve all of them and not have overcrowding issues because each of those schools can, can serve more than that. So I've said a lot. I want to pause and see uh, what questions you have, board uh, members, with regard to, and this is specifically um, and especially with regard to the, um, the uh, schools that are being renovated and requiring some temporary relocations. Thank you, Dr. Green. I just want to uh, say this was really helpful, and it was great to assuage some of the community fears that are out there, be able to address directly some of the concerns like the sibling issue. And also, I, I just want to say, um, really kind of dispel the rumors out there that somehow this district has just been sitting around twiddling its thumbs, mm -hmm. that you guys have been working. Um, and um, you know, Ms. Robinson talked about this as well, and that we're in a, a strong position now to move forward. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the hard work of this district. Board members, what questions do you have? Um, Dr. Reed, I have one question about Bailey Middle School. Yes. Now, I know at one point we could not use the full building. Will these renovations make it possible to use the whole building? Yes, I believe it was that, um, the, the, I don't know what direction, um, south, the south part of the building. Um, that was offline, yes. That's, that's the area that's probably getting the most work, as I, as I understand it. Um, uh, renovating classroom space and, and building out, and, 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 and it was, um, there was a foundational issue, mm -hmm. as I recall. Uh, all of that is being, I mean, with $20 million, yes, ma'am, we're fixing all of that. Um, and excited to be fixing that. Okay, and so that the capacity of the building will be increased, therefore. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Absolutely. Other questions? Dr. Green, could you say a little bit about the, uh, the transportation with um, particularly the Pecan Park children who are now going to be going to two different schools and Isabel and other situations where parents are used to exactly where the bus is going to be and all their, their children, our children could go. So help us understand how we're addressing that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we will continue to run bus routes from the, the pick out, pickups that currently exist. The drop-off will be different. Um, but we'll continue to run bus, drop, bus routes. And I mean, they may be different routes. And, and the route itself may be somewhat different, um, different stops along the way in order to get to the, the drop-off. But we'll continue to do that. And of course, with that. Um, that by addressing that sibling issue, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the count on the bus is considered so that we have enough space for the scholars and, and all of that sort of thing. The team is already uh, drawing up new routes and, and preparing the, the plans for that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And we've got some additional uh, uh, efforts and that we'll talk with you about next, I believe next next board meeting to address our staffing issue of, uh, of bus drivers. Other questions, anything else that you think I need to clarify, board members? Wasn't there a question and, and you said we'd come back to that? It was on one of your slides. I've forgotten what it is now. I don't know. I'm not sure. I know we're missing oh. one slide in, in this. Okay. Okay. Uh, it had to do with the linear enrollment. Enrollment slide. The first of the two is not in our packet. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't have that this. One. You don't have this one. Okay. 
Um, I don't, I, I recall saying that, uh, let me see. I should have written it down. Um, where was I? I don't know if it was, I, I think at one point I signaled the, the dollar, I, I believe it may have been here. I, as I gave the, the listing of the amounts that we'll be spending in these, um, at these three, these four schools, and started talking about some of the projects there, I was going to come back to the project listings here. So that may have been the, the item. Thank you. Dr. Green, I know Dr. Seaback has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Green, um, one of the other uh, meetings, I think it might have been missed on one of the slides that um, was held last week was a community meeting at Isabel. Um, and one of the concerns raised was um, just the need for additional renovations at Isabel. And, you know, it's a school that already has needs and it will have another year of wear and tear from students being in there. Um, what plans do we have to, um, you know, invest similarly or to, or, or to, you know, upgrade that space, you know, as scholars return or after they return? Um, again, recognizing there are more needs that, than we can cover, um, but I still want to make sure we um, at least uh, have a conversation about those concerns that were raised. Yes, sir. And, and while uh, I, I'll have to ask the team if, if there are already drawn up plans uh, for improvements at Isabel. Um, you're coming? Oh, lovely. I'm so excited to say yes. We've met with um, the high school's division, um, look, uh, Ms. Marshall Thomas, uh, Mr. Brown, and also Ms. Crawford, uh, principal at Isabel on Monday. And we already have a game plan. The design firm was there as well. So as soon as Jim Hill moves out in May of 2023, uh, we will start renovations at Isabel. So when we receive the, the students at Isabel um, that August, they will have a renovated space. And, and obviously we're happy to, well one, happy to have some funds that we can utilize and spend on that in that regard. But this is because they have been, will have been inconvenienced for the next year, uh, just kind of exacerbated our desire to, to want to do something uh, for them as they prepare to come back into their building. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it was raised uh, with me, uh, what, what is JPS doing? And just for the record, uh, what is Jackson Public School District doing uh, in collaboration with the city of Jackson uh, to clean up areas around uh, specifically Linnea, where they're going to get a different uh, demographic of student. Has any conversations taken place? Not that I'm aware of. If, if they Not have, I'm aware it of. may be something good to uh, consider. Okay. And I see that. And, and, and I, I just want to, it sounds like there's support for that. I just want to be clear on kind of what's the ask. One, we can just reach out to the city to see what is planned, if anything's planned, and then to advocate for. Well, we got uh, somebody mentioned torn down apartments, and they are torn down apartments. Mm -hmm. One spot is kept very well, uh, and, but another spot I think the church owns that. But another spot. Uh, has been an unofficial dumping site mm. and uh, the grass is not mowed. But then the city came in and cleaned up and did an excellent job on it. But, but it now is beginning to slip back yes, into sir. that condition. This actually, so I received that and, and I know folks are taking notes. Um, I think we need to expand this conversation. So sure, we want to encourage the city or see what plans are in, in place and encourage them to uh, address that area. But this is a broader, likely a broader, <laughs> and I dare say a broader question about um, areas around schools and what's the, what resources are there, what plans are there to ensure justice you've lifted up around Lanier. And Happy to go back and, and um, have that conversation with the mayor and with his team. 
and, and then another collaborative partner could be the County of Hines as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm not recalling any previous conversations. We obviously are tracking anything that happens in and around, well, around our schools. You know, any, anything that's being done to roads or, or any of that sort of thing. But um, this is it's high time for, for um, more targeted conversation around that. Thank you. Um. Uh, Mr. Fickers reminded me that I would just like to give a shout out to all of our elected officials who came to many of our uh, community meetings to listen and yes. to comment because, because we are all partners in this. So thank you for reminding me to say that. Yes, thank you. Um, and I uh, neglected to lift that up. We had uh, quite a few uh, elected officials who took the time to join us for the conversations, to uh, engage with us in conversations offline, just so they could better understand and 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 share some things that they're hearing and uh, ask questions and all sorts of things. So um, it's it's been, you know, even though I know there have been concerns lifted, it's been great the level of engagement around these uh, these plans and proposals. Um, because these are our schools, not just ours. Um, you know, while I may be fired if I don't get them right, um, you know, there are plenty of folks who co-own the future of our schools. So I appreciate that. <laughs> any other questions, board members, or anything you think I can clarify? I don't have a question. I just want to say, I just want to just say thank you. Mm. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for being res responsive, listening, hearing, and um, actually taking note and of what is the communities are saying around our schools and being able to be as flexible as we can uh, to the needs of the community. Yes, um, it is very, very important because that's who is in our buildings, in our school buildings, and if we don't, um, if we're not supportive of them, they can't be supportive of us. And so I just appreciate the, the district really taking the time to do that, to listen. I know it seems and it feels last minute to community right now, but I know that, that the work has been being done all along because this was big work and it was, it would have been a, a whole bigger can of worms to open up before it was ready to be presented, right? So you all, this behind the scenes work that has been done has been really good, but then to hear, to put it out for the community, hear what their concerns are, and then come back this quickly with addressing some of those concerns is really good, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Board members, any other questions? All right, with that, I believe we're ready to move on to information action items. Dr. Green, your backup edit, approval of the proposal to consolidate Baker and Shirley Elementary Schools. Okay, uh, so the first uh, item, board members, um, before you, the administration is uh, requesting your support and approval of the proposal to uh, consolidate Baker uh, and elementary middle schools and thereby uh, closing Baker Elementary School. As we previously reported, and, and I believe you're uh, well aware at this time, we've sustained um, uh, decline in enrollment at Baker. We've also sustained, unfortunately, some uh, pretty major uh, vandalism at Baker and, um, and uh, that makes it uh, impossible for us to run the systems um, in the way that they need to be run and, and keeping uh, our scholars and team members um, comfortable and, and safe in the building, especially as we're heading into the summer months and, and all of that. The repair of the system at Baker, uh, we would not be able to get the parts to repair, just to repair the system that exists in Baker for the next year. But on top of that, 
Um, Baker is another one of those systems, those schools where it needs, it actually needs considerable um, replacement, uh, renovation, et cetera, to bring the HVAC system up to where it needs to be. It does not make sense to invest in that building given the amount of money that it would take to bring the system up to where it needs to be and, and reliably functioning. Um, and therefore, we are asking that you approve this proposal to, um, um, to consolidate the two schools and, and thereby closing Baker Elementary School. Shirley Elementary uh, is set for some continued work and improvement. Uh, as I uh, displayed previously or just a little while ago, the um, building, the Shirley Elementary School, has plenty room to receive all of the scholars. Uh, in fact, uh, in total, we will have, I believe it's 360, about 360 scholars with both the Baker Scholars and Shirley Elementary Scholars. And it's with that that we, um, we ask your support of this proposal. Board members, any questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve information action item A? Dr. Dr. Luckett, I did have um, I did have a question. Okay, Dr. Seback. That's two questions. Um, Dr. Green, one of the concerns that I heard um, at the Baker meeting um, was specifically around um, plans for the space. Once Baker Baker is vacant, there were there were significant concerns around just having a vacant building um, in the community and. Um, you know what would happen to it. You know, concerns that it would be continue to be vandalized. It would it would it would add blight to the community. Um, so, what is what is our our plan around um, addressing those concerns um, for whatever timetable it may take? Yes, sir. Uh, as the board members know, and some of our community members may or may not know, we uh, the board has asked uh, that the administration engage engage with. Um, contractors to conduct a pretty extensive um, study of all of our properties uh, to, to gather information about the facilities themselves uh, and the condition of those facilities. So we did both a, con a conditions study of each individual building and then a broader um, uh, property study uh, across all of our uh, footprint across the city. Of, of our buildings and, and properties. And so with that information, we're armed with um, uh, uh, information that, that developers uh, may want to see and, and to help them to consider any development or purchase of those buildings. Um, we're prepared to, and, and are already are, facilitating any uh, requests or interests for the purchase of those buildings to operate various uh, programs and that sort of thing in those buildings. Uh, we are continuing to work with uh, a planner and then we'll be working with a developer or a, a number of developers uh, who have interest in certain buildings or another. And so while there isn't, uh, because we're just now coming to you with this plan for or proposal for uh, closing and consolidating Baker, there hasn't been conversation about Baker because it has not as, as yet been available to folks. Um, but in line with other buildings that are or will be would be available for purchase or lease or um, redevelopment or, or what have you, uh, uh, Baker would be available for that as well. We're also, and, and mentioning the city earlier about some of the cleanup and that, the Jackson Redevelopment Authority, uh, we've been engaged with them over some time to support us in thinking about development in and around communities. Um, and, and last thing I'll say is uh, some of the information we've gathered uh, leads us to uh, certain projects that might be best suited for certain buildings. And so building by building, even those that are, that are currently occupied, uh, we have some sense of uh, whether this is a building that could be ripe for uh, housing development, redevelopment, or for retail, or for something else. 
Um, and so with that information, we were able to accept proposals or bids or, or um, uh, inquiries from various individuals who may want to occupy those spaces. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, the, the other question I had um, was specific to Shirley. Um, similar, it's a similar question to Isabel. Um, I've heard that um, Shirley, like many of our other schools, uh, has continued needs, um, and so it is now going to be a receiving school. Um, and uh, so, what are, are do we have plans on the board to to make upgrades and investments in Shirley, given that that's going to be the the new home for these? For, for the existing scholars, it's not a new home, but for the new ones and for the existing ones to have the spaces that, that we talk about in our strategic plan. So uh, I know that we have, I believe we've got some window replacements. Am I making this up? Let me stop talking. Uh, Ms. Robinson is coming up to the mic to respond. Mm -hmm. So we have done uh, restroom renovations at Shirley as part of our bond. That work was completed. Um, and we, uh, the most significant need right now is HVAC replacements. So we're in the process of ordering new units. That school received a new roof um, as a result of our hailstorm um, proceeds that we did. So it doesn't need the same um, number of um, upgrades, but we are working with Dr. Um, Beals, the principal, to identify anything that we need to do, painting, to make sure the school is inviting and bright and welcoming for students um, in August. So, but we do have window replacements and HVAC upgrades identified in, in the ESSER funds. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Board members, any other questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve information action item A? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Johnson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. There being none, the motion is approved. Dr. Green, that brings us to information action item B, the proposal to reconfigure Lanier High School and consolidate with Brinkley Middle School. Board members, the administration brings to you for uh, your approval a proposal to reconfigure Lanier High School into a uh, middle and high school uh, consolidating with the current Brinkley Middle School and thereby closing uh, the Brinkley Middle School, ceasing to operate as a as a middle school. We, uh, as we've discussed previously, um, there's been considerable concern uh, with regard to Lanier High School and the size of the school. Um, there's magic happening in the school. The the leadership team the um, the the uh, the teachers, the partners. There's a buzz that's happening in in Lanier High School. You've seen it actually, and that was not planned. The um, Mr. Jones shared some information about graduation rates, and we shared earlier some of the. There's a slight uptick in in enrollment, um, but there's a there's a buzz that's happening at the at the school. There's programming there. There's an academy, um, health sciences that exists there. Uh, several things that are redeeming about Lanier High School. Unfortunately, it remains to be a small school. And in order to uh, ensure that we've got the funding mechanism to continue to operate the school, to provide the robust programming and opportunities that those scholars um, deserve, um, we, we are bringing to you this proposal to reconfigure the school as a middle and high. And so, um, along with that, we, we and we actually heard this in one of the, um, actually it was last night at the uh, community meeting, uh, several folks saying very positive things about Brinkley, very positive things about what the adults are doing and what the leader is doing. Um, and we're excited to hear that. And those things are transferable. Nothing that was shared was 
was limited to and unique to that building. And so we're excited to build on that momentum, both at Lanier and the momentum that's starting at Brinkley uh, Middle School, but to do it in a space where we can financially support and build out additional programming. Uh, Brinkley, too, we haven't talked much about it. Brinkley, too, it has declined a bit in enrollment, but more importantly, Brinkley has significant significant um, issues in terms of the building. And we're trying to patch it and, and hold on for a little longer because we needed a swing space, as we discussed previously, for another school to move in while we do work at their uh, home school. Um, but it simply does not make sense to do the level of renovations at Brinkley uh, Middle School, given the size of the school. Um, and ways that we can operate elsewhere. And so that plus all of the work and the planning that the um, school community has been doing um, and partners have been doing to uh, build out the community schools model, um, we believe it's time this, this, um, this unfortunate situation with Powell being displaced and with Brinkley Middle School needing additional investments that we're not prepared to make, uh, it, it presents an opportunity for us to move on this reconfiguration at Lanier High School. And so it's for all of those reasons and more board members that we implore you to uh, support this proposal to reconfigure Lanier as a middle and high school, um, to um, uh, consolidate with Brinkley uh, Middle and to cease to operate uh, the current Brinkley Middle School at their current building. Board members, do you have any questions? Mr. Figures. Uh, we, we have something lingering, I think, in the way that you uh, close that, uh, that statement. Yes, sir. I think is extremely significant. Uh, you got a little knack about saying stuff that's extremely significant. Uh, Thank you, sir. So what you said left lingering but open, uh, not retiring the name Sam M. Brinkley, uh, which is to many a very historic name. And but if I could, I'd make the motion to accept this recommendation if I could capture that wording that you closed with. Uh, I forgot how I closed. <laughs> <laughs> I was caught up in the compliment. I, I forgot how I closed. <laughs> it, 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 uh, uh, but I can, I, I you want me to I try? To try. So, so, and I didn't say thank you so much for this question comment, um, Mr. Figures. Um, and for the Amen Corner, uh, we heard very clearly last night at that community meeting. Um, and it took a few tries at the mic, but eventually we got to a, a very clear recommendation, proposal, um, request that we retain and protect the legacy of Mr. Brinkley. And so, um, and there was a specific recommendation to rename Powell. Now, I can't commit to that right now because I need to do some more work on, well, who was Mr. Powell and what might this look like? Is that the, is that the right move? Um, but I can commit to preserving that legacy within our district. That I can commit to. And so does that help? Yeah, that, that carries us down. Okay. I don't have a question, but last night I attended that session and of course, um, many of you know, I am not a Jackson native, um, but all of my children matriculated through Jackson Public Schools. Um, I have six graduates of Jackson Public Schools. But last night was the first night that I heard a lot more history and why all of this 833 and all of the exists, you know, um, you know, just the Brinkley and the Powell, and I heard it with passion, I heard it with love, and I heard community, right? So what came to my mind was that we do need to preserve 
yes, the legacy of Jackson Public Schools, all of the history of how Jackson, the, the original three black high schools, as well as where we are. So I, I, it came to me that we should have our students, and I, I shared it with Dr. Uh, Harrison, and I shared it with Ms. Thomas, our students um, that are part of our uh, journalism or um, filmmaking or whatever com mass communications to develop a documentary that describes the history of our schools, the namesakes, why they are where they are, where they, where they move. So where we started, where we are now, bring it up to the takeover, you know, where they tried to take us over now, and where we are right now, and where we're going. Because we are one school, we're one, direct, we're one district now, one direction, marching towards excellence. And so all of those pieces have to come together and flow to take us to another level in the city, this capital city, that we're rising to a place where they don't know where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. But we know we're going to the top, the top, the number one school district, not only in the state of Mississippi, but in the country, okay? So, but we gotta know where we started from so we don't, don't lose that legacy, we build on it, we stand on those shoulders, and then we move forward and go forward from there. So something like that to continue the legacy of why the passion is so here and the fight is so strong to keep our schools and the legacy of our schools alive. We need to understand that, and our students will be the best ones to do it because when they put those TikTok videos out there, we, we watch them, right? So they can do it, and I know they can give us a real Really good product about the history of Jackson Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Thompson, I, I so appreciate that. Is that that nugget you were going to share with me last night? That's it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> right. So, so I so appreciate that, and and I'm already the wheels are turning for how we make this happen. And um, going back to the earlier, earlier, earlier presentation from the scholars who are in this Global Citizenship Project, a piece of that is about learning about your city, yeah. your home, your history in that. So whether it's that specific project or a, something that's just a legacy, a JPS legacy project, there's, um, I'm pretty confident that we could get some support to uh, help the scholars to have this ex experience and develop um, something that's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and to address the specific recommendation about um, Powell High Middle School and and the naming and and what have you. So we we I I, I don't want to lose track of that recommendation. Um, I hear both uh, that there's an opportunity to in a very concerted, uh, intentional way capture and preserve history, legacy, and this other piece about um, the name and and namesake on on um, the Powell Building. Board members, other questions? Comment. And since that's come out, and thank you, Ms. <laughs> Thompson, uh, how we respect the community that's, that exists around schools, I think, is also vitally and strategically important how we respect communities and community voice is vitally and strategically important if we're going to be successful in moving to that level that you just spoke about, Ms. Thompson. So let's consider that yes, sir. Uh, and place that rather than a afterthought as a forethought mm -hmm. to what we do going forward. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, Mr. Figures and Ms. Thompson. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions, board? Is there a motion to approve information action item B? Now, I'm going to offer the motion in the spirit of, and, and I'm going to ask the uh, uh, film person 
to clip that last portion of the uh, closing remark of Dr. Green's <laughs> statement. Uh, but uh, I'm going to offer the motion that we accept the recommendation uh, to reconfigure Linear High School uh, and uh, inclusive of the Brinkley Middle School students. Second. How's that? It's been uh, moved by Mr. Figured, second by Mrs. Thompson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none, the motion is approved. Information action item C, approval of the supplemental grant agreement with the Equal Justice Initiative and the Jackson Public Schools for Provine High School. Attorney Moore. Good evening. Good evening. Well, President Dr. Sevak, board members Dr. Green, the Office of the General Counsel is presenting for information action, approval of the supplemental agreement between the Equal Justice Initiative and Provine High School. This is for the scholars at Provine to be able to attend the uh, museum in Montgomery, Alabama, from uh, the Legacy Museum from Slavery to Mass Incarceration. The board originally approved the original agreement at a board meeting in September, and additional funds are needed for the students to go on the trip. So this supplemental agreement will cover that trip. Thank you, Attorney Moore. I, the last two items were uh, big ticket items, apparently, but this is one of my favorite things we're doing in the school district right <laughs> now, so right. it's exciting. Questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve information action item C? I so move. Second. Been moved by Mrs. Thompson, seconded by Mr. Figures. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Being none, the motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Moore. Moving on, uh, it looks like Mr. David Chalmer has items D, E, and F, approval of the agreement between the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality and Jackson Public School District. Agreement between the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and JPS for mental health service professional, and the approval of the agreement between Consulting Plus LLC, Dr. Rodney Washington, and the Jackson Public School District. Mr. Schammer, I think you could present all of these, all three of these now, and we'll, we'll move forward with them. All right, good evening, Dr. Green, members of the board. Good evening. The administration recommends approval of the agreement between the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality, MDEQ, and Jackson Public School District. The MDEQ bus rebate agreement will provide over $23,000 in grant funds to JPS to allow for the purchase of one new school bus to replace our 2001 Freightliner school bus. Uh, the purpose of this agreement is to reduce diesel emissions in Mississippi through the implementation of approved projects selected from the Mississippi School Bus Replacement Program. Uh, reducing diesel uh, emissions is currently one of the most important air quality challenges in Mississippi. The rebate program assists school districts in the replacing of older buses with newer low emitting buses. This grant opportunity was made available through the Mississippi Diesel School Bus Replacement Program. JPS was one of 13 school districts selected to receive a rebate to replace one bus. This will be our second year to receive a rebate. Questions? <laughs> Questions on item D? Item E. All right. Next item. Uh, the administration recommends approval of the Mental Health Service Professional MHSP Project Grant Agreement between the U.S. Department of Education Office of Elementary and Secondary Education and Jackson Public School District. The $2 million grant project will establish a pipeline of mental health service providers through Jackson State University for the next five years. The grant allows for the placement of JSU graduate students in JPS for the purpose of completing required field work, credit hours, internships, or related training necessary to complete their degree or obtain a credential as a school-based mental health service provider. This may include social workers, school psychologists, and counselors. Funds will be used to cover, help cover tuition costs, offer a modest salary for internships, professional development, travel, equipment, supplies, memberships to related professional associations, project administration, and external evaluation. The Mental Health Service Professional 
project will improve mental health outcomes and academic achievement of our students and much more. The JPS Mental Health Service uh, Professional Project is made possible through the U.S. Department of Education MHSP grant program. Now, this grant is in addition to the first $2.7 million school-based mental health service providers grant we received back in January, which was specifically for the hiring of additional mental health service providers for the district. Any questions? And item F. All right. The administration recommends approval of the MOU between Consulting Plus LLC, Dr. Rodney Washington, to provide external evaluation services of the Mental Health Service Professional Grant. Grant funds will be used to contract with Consulting Plus LLC to conduct an external evaluation of all MHSP grant activities. Funds are approximately 5% of the total grant amount to cover the cost of evaluation across the district. Consulting Plus LLC is an experienced research evaluation organization, and they will provide process and outcome evaluation of the Mental Health Service Professional Grant Program using multiple validated assessment tools to provide ongoing analysis of program results. The expenses include uh, multiple evaluator consultant fees, travel, supplies, office expenses, and technology-related costs. Any questions? Good work. We're good? All right. <laughs> Being none, I would entertain a motion to approve information action items D, E, and F. So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison is moved. Ms. Thompson is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none, the motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Tommy Knowles. He has the next two items on our information action item list. Approval of the engagement letter with Watts and Watts, a renewal, and approval of engagement between the law offices of Anti Wynn, Attorneys at Law, and the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Knowles. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Green. The administration recommends that the board approve the engagement letter with the immigration law firm Watson Watts. This is a proposed renewal agreement or renewal engagement based on prior satisfactory representation of the district. The administration is seeking to engage with the immigration law firm Watson Watts to support the H-1B visa filing process for an international teacher candidate. This candidate currently feels a critical shortage vacancy in physics for our district. Any questions? Item H, Dr. Knowles. Right. So the administration is recommending that the board approve the engagement letter with the Immigration Law Office of Ann Nguyen. This is also a proposed renewal engagement based on prior satisfactory representation of the district. The administration is seeking to engage with the Law Office of Ann Nguyen to support the H-1B uh, visa filing process for eight international candidates currently employed in critical shortage areas of mathematics and science in JPS. I love seeing proposed agreements with lawyers to support our teachers. <laughs> uh, is there, are there any questions? Being none, is there a motion to approve uh, information action items G and H? So moved. Second. Attorney Johnson, Dr. Harrison have moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Being none, the motions are approved. Next, we have consent agenda items general. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously. We've had the opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, is there a motion to approve consent agenda item Oh, I skipped finance, didn't I? We've got to start with finance. Is, all the finance items have been presented to us. Is there, are there any questions on the consent agenda item finance? If none, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items finance? So moved. Second. Attorney Johnson, Ms. Thompson have moved and seconded to approve consent agenda items finance. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none, the motion is approved. Now we're on to consent agenda item general. There being no questions before, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items general? 
So move. Second. Mr. Second. Uh, Mr. Figures has moved. Dr. Harrison beat you there, Dr. Sivak, to a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Being none, consent agenda items general is approved. Next we have consent agenda items personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously. We've had the opportunity to ask questions. Are there any further questions? Being none, is there a motion to approve consent agenda items personnel? Second. Dr. Sivak has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Being none, the motion is approved. We do have uh, items to discuss in executive session. Is there a motion to close the meeting to consider going into executive session? So moved. Second. It has been moved by Mr. Figures and seconded by Ms. Thompson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Being none, the motion is approved. Thank you, everybody, for all your hard work.